Dear John, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here and I would like to set the stage more or less for the next speaker as well who is going to give you the new stuff. I'm just giving you now an overview of what do we have right now, but we have quite a bit. First of all, what is the challenge in pancreatic cancer? And I think one of the challenges is intertumoral heterogeneity. Almost no tumors are alike. These are data from genomic analysis and whole genome sequencing, but we have similar data now from exome sequencing, and that makes this tumor rather tricky. Another challenge is that the fogelgram of a continuous but slow evolution, a gradual evolution of the cancer, is probably not true, at least for certain pancreatic cancers. And I would like to refer you to this very interesting paper published in Nature last year, where they could actually show there is a punctuated equilibrium, and due to genomic instability from mitotic errors, you get a catastrophe, a revolution of the tumor, and by that token, you have an explosion of the disease, which I think mirrors in at least some instances what we see in a clinical setting. Of course, this makes treatment far more difficult. So what do we, ha we have so far? This is back in time. Where do we come from? We come from an era of gemcitabine where we had single agent treatment for many years with a clinical benefit improvement and a one year overall survival rate of around about 20%, median overall survival of around about six months. Then we tried for many years several things like Rubik's Cube oncology, so we combined anything with everything, in particular when there was gemcitabine involved, but we didn't make much progress. Maybe a little progress with allotinib, 14 days improvement in the median overall survival in the whole trial, but an interesting trend towards a much better survival when you had grade, more than grade two or equal to grade two skin toxicity. The problem is that it's not predictable who is going to have skin toxicity, so it's actually not a good biomarker because you don't see that uh, up front. Real progress came with the French protocol, the Protégé protocol for Fulfurinox. And this was rather brief at that time because they used the protocol which was gemcitabine free. And they could really show that you can get response in pancreatic cancer and metastatic disease with 31% as compared to gem with around about 10%. And you can get st disease stabilization in a substantial proportion of patients in addition. And this, of course, translated into overall survival, 11.1 months, and progression-free survival of sig um, significantly increased with hazard ratios of 0.57 and 0.47, which we hadn't seen so far for this disease. So finally, it turned out that pancreatic cancer is not entirely chemotherapy-resistant, and there is some progress to be made. Of course, you see that in all subgroups very nicely with the Fulfurinox protocol, but this comes at a price. Gemcitabine was very moderately toxic and could be very easily handled. Fulfurinox is different, and you see in particular neutropenia and fibrinotropenia have to be monitored closely, and there is, of course, more diarrhea. The oxaliplatin causes more sensory neuropathy, and we have transaminitis. So we have some really strict criteria for this protocol, and patients eligible for this protocol should have an ECOV of 0 to 1, should have a bilirubin below 1.5 times the upper level of normal, and an age only up to 75 years. This is the CONRA criteria, and I think this is very sensible to stick to these criteria. Finally, we also got a GEM plus X that worked, and this was GEM plus napaclitaxel. Maybe because we have a new mechanism of action. One, because we have a cavalian-based transport of the taxane to the tumor, increasing the tumor concentrations uh, of the taxane. And maybe secondly, because we have an interaction between gemcitabine and napaclitaxel, whereby napaclitaxel increases the active gemcitabine concentration by reducing cytidine deaminase levels. Whatever the reason may be, we see a marked improvement in overall survival, bearing in mind this was a multinational trial uh, all over the world, whereas the Prodigy trial was a, only a French trial in experienced centers. Here we have a hazard ratio of 0.72, an improvement in median overall survival from 6.6 .6 to 8.7 months, and in the progression-free survival, also a hazard ratio of 0.69. In all cases, we have an improvement in the survival rate at 6, 12, 24, 36 months. So this protocol was at last showing that GEM plus X also adds benefit for our patients. 
Interestingly, in contrast to Folferinox, this trial also included patients with a lower performance status, and as you can see in the forest plots, even with a KPS of 70 to 80, you do really well in this combination, which is not the case for Folferinox. At least it hasn't been shown in the ACCORD trial. But this, I think, is interesting news for the patient because we have quite a few with a worse performance status. Of course, all this, also this protocol is more toxic than gemcitabine alone. The use of growth factors is less than in the Folferinox protocol, and there is a lower rate of fibrinolipopenia, but it's not naught. Of course, also we have neuropathy with the taxanes, um, more than grade three, but it takes a bit, uh, it takes around about 140 days for onset. But when you discontinue, you have a very rapid uh, recovery of patients. So when we compare the protocols, you can see the gemcitabine arm in both trials was really well comparable. And you see that both protocols significantly improve overall survival, response rate, and progression-free survival. There is a tendency in better overall survival for fall free NOx, but I'm not sure what this holds through when we only compare Western uh, patients. And there is a slightly less uh, percentage of febrile neutropenia in favor of gem napaclitaxel. What do we now do in first-line setting? I think we should use the most efficacious protocol for our patients. So we really should not delay intensified treatment in the first-line setting. Pancreatic cancer is an aggressive disease that should be treated aggressively. And we now have two protocols available. You see, Folfrenox has some limitations, higher age, ECOG uh, more than one, and elevated bilirubin. Gemnapacitaxel has a bit broader application range because we can use it in elderly patients, which has been done in the IMPACT trial, and also with an ECOG of more than one. However, I would add a word of caution, using it in uh, case of bilirubin levels more than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal. This was not done in the IMPACT trial. For all other patients that do not qualify for these two protocols, I think then we have we are left with gemcitabine, maybe gemcitabine plus allotinib, but this is sort of the back burner. It's not what for I would choose for the majority of the patients. And you see there is quite a lot of combinations now when we put that in a little different algorithm, and only for the elderly patients uh, in a bad condition we have single agent protocols available. What about second-line treatment? Five years, eight years ago, there was very little done in second-line setting, but now you see already from this list that we have a whole lot of new protocols coming. One of the first protocols examined was 5-FU oxaliplatin, uh, but in a slightly different uh, way of application. This is the so-called OFF protocol, and when compared to single-agent 5-FU, you see that OFF fares better median overall survival of 5.9 as compared to 3.3 months with a hazard ratio of 0.66, and this holds true in all subgroups, even for patients with a Konofsky performance status of 70 to 80. So this is a, a protocol for a typical second-line uh, treatment pancreatic cancer collective. Um, there has been a little bit of confusion with another trial from Canada. They used, they didn't use OFF, they used the Folfox protocol, which has a higher dose intensity for oxaliplatin. And what they showed is progression-free survival. Here, the yellow curve is the Folfox, the modified Folfox 6. The blue curve is 5 if you leucovorin alone. And what you see is there is a largely an overlap in progression-free survival in both curves. And surprisingly, what you see here, overall survival with 5 if you alone was 9.9 .9 months in the median. So this is the best overall survival with 5-FU we've ever seen in a second-line setting, bearing in mind gemcitabine in first line did only achieve, as in contrast to 5-FU in first line in the Burris trial, around about six months. So this is 9.9 .9 months in second line. And what you see, Folfox is actually doing roughly the same as we've seen for the OFF protocol, around about six months. So I don't know how this 9.9 .9 months come about. The worst data for Folfox are probably due to higher toxicity. We have 20% treatment stop in the Folfox arm due to uh, toxicity and only 2% in the 5FU arm. So my conclusion is if you use oxaliplatin in second line, maybe not using modified Folfox 6, but rather use the off protocol. And I still, I still really a little bit um, 
a little bit uh, at loss why there is such a good performance of 5FU in second line. But we don't have to use oxaliplatin because we have another protocol now with a Napoli trial using the nanoliposomal irinotecan in combination with 5FU that showed a marked difference, significant difference in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.67 uh, in comparison to 5FU. The agent by itself, nanoliposomal irinotecan, compared to 5FU did not show any significant difference in overall survival. The idea is with a nanoliposomal formulation to get a better access to the tumor and increase higher intertumoral concentrations of the drug. Median overall survival was 6.1 months as compared to 4.2 months for the combination 5FU leucovorin plus MM398. This is also a protocol for patients in a worse performance status, and uh, you see the majority here had in uh, uh, above one had a uh, Konofsky of 80, quite a few patients had also 70, and this is interesting, um, there was quite a high proportion of patients having received at least two lines, but there were patients in third and fourth line even in uh, receiving this protocol. When we look at the forest plot here, you see that the combination was superior as compared to 5 view in most of the cases. And this is something I would like to point out. This protocol really fared well, not only in patients having received zero early progressors in the adjuvant setting, or one line, then a two second line scenario, but also in those patients having received at least two lines of treatment. Toxicity has to be considered. This is the typical uh, toxicity we see with ironotecan, with in particular diarrhea uh, and uh, neutropenia, but otherwise this is a well-manageable toxicity profile. Coming back to other options for second-line treatment, this is a study of napaclitaxel, a single agent, small trial, and you see it can achieve something. And but maybe this is the overall survival data, and you see this is also in the range between seven and eight months as a single agent. Most people probably would like to use a combination, in particular after a Forferinox protocol, and I would like to add a word of warning. This is not a randomized trial. This is a cohort trial in 57 patients that had received, uh, that received a median of four cycle of gemcitabine napaclitaxel, all had been pretreated with Folferinox in this uh, French trial. There was a response rate in second line of still 17.5% with a median progression-free survival of 5.1 months and a median overall survival of 8.8 .8 months, 18 months in total. However, there was a substantial grade 4, 3 toxicity with 40% of the patients experiencing grade 3, 4 toxicity, in particular neutropenia, neurotoxicity, asthenia, and thrombopenia. So, in conclusion, this is a protocol that works well for those who actually can get it after for free NOx, but this is cohort studies, highly selected patients, and I think we should wait for a randomized trial. But for the first time, we also have a selection in the second line scenario, and we can have a differentiated approach in treating patients. After Fulfirinox, we have gemcitabine, and there are data from uh, the ACCORD trial showing that this still gives uh, benefit in the second line setting after Fulfirinox. The question is, and we don't know this yet, how well does gemnapaclitaxel perform in these patients in a randomized fashion? The cohort trial I've just been showing to you, and we have no data on 5 of Naliri because patients were not pretreated with a triple chemotherapy in first line in the Napoli trial. Gemcitabine opens up all the possibilities. We have 5 of Naliri, we have the off protocol. We probably will never use Fulfrinox or gemnapaclitaxel because, at least not in my clinic, because we would use the most active protocols in first line and do not an escalation strategy rather than a de-escalation strategy. But if you encounter a patient who would have been eligible for a combination but didn't get it in first line, then maybe more intensive protocols would be justified. For gemnapaclitaxel, we have, of course, 5 fu null -ERI. We also have the off protocol if neurotoxicity allows. And whether everybody, anybody uses Fulfrinox in the second line setting, I think this will be limited to very, very few patients. Of course, in future, we hopefully will select the optimal treatment according to molecular characteristics of the tumor. And you just heard these very two, nice two presentations on targeting stromal components such as hyaluronic acid. You heard already from Margaret Temperi, and we'll hear, hear more about that from Philip Philip about 
subgroups like uh, BRCA mutated um, tumors or what, how we can address the checkpoint, uh, how we can use checkpoint inhibition in the setting of pancreatic cancer. To conclude my talk, how can, what is the improving the outcome of patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer? I think we come from a one drug fits all strategy to very differentiated options in various lines. And the thing is, it's good news for the patients. And we can actually adapt the treatment according to the situation of the patient. In future, I hope we will be able to adapt the treatment to the heterogeneity of the tumor and target more subgroups of pancreatic cancer, not just maybe MSI or BRCA. And there is far more to come. And I can promise to you, and you will see that in a minute from Philip's talk. Thank you very much for your attention.